Hi everyone. I'm really um, sorry about that. We seem to be having a few technical um, difficulties there with um, Katie um, on on the line. Hopefully she will be back um, with us um, shortly. But we'll, let, let's um, continue. We have about another um, 15 minutes or so, and it's quite important that we uh, have an opportunity to um, listen to some of your um, questions and have a response from our from our panel. So it's great to see Caroline, uh, Musa, Sam, and uh, Leah. Uh, back with us. So the first question for the panelists so that um, Harry, um, how would you define social mobility in the world of diversity and inclusion and how would you identify those that fit into this group? Does anyone want to share their thoughts um, with us? So how would you de define social I'm, mobility? I'm happy to jump in Patrick and give the classic lawyer's answer, which is, of course, it depends. Mm. Um, th there is no definition. Um, social mobility really is about opening up opportunities for people from backgrounds which are non-traditional. That's, mm. the, that's the phrase we use because it means different things for different people in different environments. I think traditionally speaking, it is about, you know, wealth, class, um, you know, the, the normal um markers of those that tend to be what your parents do for a living and um, whether or not your parents went to university and um, whether you advance in terms of social status by attending university or making more money than than your parents did but i think to be honest with you it's far more fluid than that i mean the other speakers have talked a bit tonight about accents about regional differences about things things like that i think from my perspective and i can't speak on behalf of the law society but part of our role as ambassadors is actually to show that there is a huge variety of people coming from a huge variety of backgrounds making success and that success looks different to different people and you know we've got like Musa said earlier we, we've got people that come from and um, they're asylum seekers they come from they come outside the UK they, they couldn't speak English and they've sort of managed to navigate through those systems we have people who come from and um, non-traditional backgrounds but they're also um, LGBT so they they have different issues there as well so I don't think there's an easy way to say basically if your parents earn less than thirty thousand pound you're poor and therefore you 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 fall into this category it, it's more complex but it's mm. you know th there's lots of us that are fighting I think a lot of these battles on lots of fronts that's great Thanks. Caroline, did you want to uh, come in as well? I think it is. It's a really complex thing. It's one of those situations, I think, when you know it, when you see it. And it's quite difficult to write down what we mean when we say, well, who, who would be a candidate for support? Because, you know, they require some social mobility assistance. I, I think it, it's, it's really, really hard. And it, it's hard when you weave that in with, you know, all of the other of the other protected characteristics because class is not a protected characteristic. So I think it, it is complicated and people can fall into that category at very different times in their life or their families can, they can dip in and out of it. We seem to, in this country over the past decade or so, really seem to have promoted quite unstable working practices for families that can make it difficult and people will dip in and out of requiring you know state support that is not the only test because you could have two parents who are in very in employment but very low paid employment but where they they themselves haven't been beneficiaries of a strong education system and that can be for lots of reasons it can be opportunity it can be ability it can be they've had to focus their attention elsewhere you know often people are pulled in directions of having to be carers but both for parents and our other family members there can be lots and lots of pressure and money can make that easier because certain support can be brought in to free people up to do other things so I think it is very complicated but I think all of us on the panel from with, with some similarities in our experience from but from very different experiences we would all say that we know it when we see it and I would say that Musa's case is actually very very different because listening to his story and watching that film and the thought of being alone is is a very frightening thing and being alone in a foreign country with quite an alien and complex legal system to navigate so in many ways i feel um that my 
social mobility is from a very privileged start. And I think that, you know, Musa, you will go on to achieve great things. The one thing we all have in common is imposter syndrome is sitting there on our shoulder and we all beat ourselves up when we get a bit of rejection. But you know what? That rejection is, you know, it's a bit like missing a penalty, isn't it? You think, oh, no, but you get back up and you play again. You get back on the pitch. You want to join in this dance until in the end, you know, when life comes to its end, it's over. You don't, we are not people who want to sit on the sidelines. Um, and I think that's what will make, what will make us all continue to be advocates of social change. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much for that, uh, Caroline. I'll just move on to the um, second question. So um, this is from Emmanuel. And um, so what are businesses doing to support employees from social mobility backgrounds. Um, perhaps, um, Leah, would you like to um, answer this? Yeah, um, so I think one thing that I've seen is I think companies are starting to do a lot of um, access programs. I think that's greatly improving. And I think that directing these access programs at people who are come under the spectrum of diversity and inclusion in some way, whether that's class or race and ethnicity. And I think that's a great thing. I think Caroline mentioned the Brilliant Club. I think that's a great opportunity to run. And I think that um, businesses can be taking on their own, either partnering with charities to do that. I've seen that um, with the Social Mobility Commission, but also running their own. So I know that um, Phil Fisher runs a diversity access scheme, which is a vacation scheme targeted at people who come from less privileged backgrounds. So that's of any interest to anyone. Um, but I know that a lot of firms run similar schemes or schemes early on, like early start schemes or head start schemes or similar things. And they'll be advertised on law firms' websites that you can look at um, that are targeted at people from more diverse and less traditional lawyer backgrounds. That's great. Um, thank you. I don't know whether anyone else would anyone else like to comment on that at all. Well, the only thing I'd say is, um, to be blunt, not enough, actually, if the question is what a business is doing. Um, there are some good schemes, but um, frankly, I, I think because class is not a protected characteristic yeah. um, in law, um, it is essentially voluntary. Um, a lot of businesses and industry leaders do not accept that it is an issue. Um, and actually, um, you could make the argument that if people get to these professions, they are socially mobile. So mm -hmm. firms and, and, and industries have, have sort of done their job. And um, it is quite a complex issue. And as I say, you know, we need we all need, as Caroline, you know, talks about being agents for social change. I think we all need to carry on that fight and, and mm -hmm. do what we can internally to increase uh, awareness about the issue and increase the number of schemes and, and things that Leah talked about. But I, I, it would be remiss of me not to say that people are not doing enough. I think that's the fair fair thing to say. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks. I, I think you're right. A, a big point there about uh, social maybe social class in terms of not being a protected characteristic. Um, yeah, big mistake at the time. So um, thank you. Question, question three. Um, Carly asks, can you offer any advice to someone from a working class background trying to become a solicitor in their 30s? Um, I've been told by law firms that I will find it hard to get a training contract due to my age. And that's quite interesting. Perhaps if I, if I start with you, Sam, because you mentioned something about the average age of being, was it 29 in terms of uh, qualifying? Yeah, I, 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 I would say, and I'm sorry, I missed who asked that question, but I would say if you're being told by law firms you're going to struggle to get a contract, I wouldn't apply to those law firms. No. Um, <laughs> I, I really, I don't accept that um, as a position. I think that anyone that brings um, experience, life experience, is going to be a far better lawyer than I was when I was in my mid-20s. So um, I, I would encourage that person to do what we talked about earlier, about sitting down and mapping what skills you've got, and um, when I was a trainee, uh, there was someone in our in our intake who was in her 50s. She had been a nurse for 30 years and was doing a career change. Fantastic. The mm. skills that she will bring far outweigh anything that you can get from work mm. experience. I know Leah mentioned about her cohort as well. I don't know if she wants to come in, but I, I think it's there will be challenges because you have difficulties when you're older anyway, applying for work and as mature students. But I really would not be discouraged. That's great. 
thank you. But uh, Leah, would you like to um, respond? I know you did mention it. Yeah, I just agree uh, with everything that Sam said and just said say that there are firms who that won't be an issue for, definitely. And that in from personal experience, my intake at the moment, there are a number of trainees that are over 30 in my intake and there are plenty of firms where that'll be the case. Um, I'm on the younger age of my intake at 25 and I think there are two or three over 30 out of 15 or so of us. So there are definitely firms out there. Caroline. I think, you know, there's a couple of points to make here. One, it's discriminatory to say that, you know, you, you can't, you're not going to have a chance because you're 30. I say that as someone who's almost double that age. So I think there's, there's plenty of chance. And also we're living in a world where people will have a longer life working expectancy and indeed will need to work for longer. We will hopefully stay healthier, living different lifestyles. But the working age is being pushed out, as indeed is the pension age. So to start in your 30s is still looking at potentially a 40 year career. I, so it's very, very short sighted um, to say, well, actually, you know, age is a barrier. I think perhaps, you know, some people would think I want a young person who I can, you know, perhaps ask, you know, to work incredibly long hours, whereas someone that little bit more mature would probably think we don't really need to do all of this as a smarter way to achieve what we need to to achieve here. But I, I don't think you should be taking no for an answer. I think, you, you know, you'll find the right firm and then you'll fly. When I was at law school, many, many mature people were coming out of what was then was the Greater London Council as it was disbanded and all came to the College of Law. Some people arrived there who'd had military careers or had worked in, you know, the special services. So I, I, I would not take no for an answer. Just keep on going. That's great. Thank you, um, Caroline. You did scare me a bit there talking about how long. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought I was going to be close to the end of that. <laughs> Don't do that to me. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so a question for uh, Musa, perhaps this one's um, that you, you can answer. So um, Laura has asked, um, what do you think are the biggest barriers to social mobility? Uh, thank you, Patrick. I mean, there are quite a few, but uh, one of the main ones I think is that people don't uh, come up with their problems or take the rejection and don't uh, follow it up because they feel that they don't have a way out or they don't have someone to support them and i think that is one uh, uh, one uh, something that need to be worked on because there is help for everyone there is help you can find help you have to look for it you have university that uh, you have the well-being officer or you have uh, you have people that can help you but uh, you don't go and ask for this uh, for the help and that is uh, for me one of the biggest problem and people suffer in silence and then they lose their confidence and they lose their will to carry on or to work for it and then they just try to find other things to do i think that's one of the main things uh, second uh, uh, other thing that i think is institution as you said are doing a lot but that there there is more to be done and also uh, making policies that uh, make it a requirement to welcome people from diverse uh, backgrounds. I mean, for me, one of the greatest things I like about you, Law, is that uh, when my when exams are uh, marked, they are not marked by the name, but for their numbers. And then you see the grade that you have. And that is one of the greatest policy that need to be implemented everywhere. And not just to the exam, but also when you recruit someone, you don't need to know about their name or their gender or if it's white, black, gay or uh, uh, social status. You only have to see at their skills. And I think we are go society is still going to struggle till this kind of policy is implemented everywhere. And then you'll see that at the top are not just uh, uh, people that have gone in private education, but are people that actually uh have the ability and skills to do the work awesome thank you that's great thank you that, that's really helpful musa um i'm conscious of time but there is um 
one question that has just come in uh, for Caroline, which I would like to um, just ask her to pick up on. So what if you feel like the exams are scary? How can you prepare for them better? A apart from practice papers, um, given the sort of COVID climate, uh, teaching online has been really difficult for this person. There we go. I think we, you know, we all accept and understand that this climate has been a great challenge and exams are always scary. And, you know, back in my day, we just did back to back exams, no open book, and you had to try to memorise everything. So this is a very new world I'm navigating here as Dean with far more directed learning. I think online can be a challenge because we all benefit from real life. We are humans and we are tactile and we are live. And that's, you know, what we all engage with. And we're making the very best of an online experience. Um, a tip I always use, uh, there's a fantastic herbal remedy called Dr. Bark's Rescue Remedy. That is something, you, know, you can buy it in boots, you can take it in a pastel form or a few little drops on it just for me and for everyone I know, it will just take away that kind of anxiety about sitting down to do the exam because there's nothing worse than that feeling that you actually can't even get yourself settled in into the zone. I think the, the exams themselves, people understand, the markers understand the circumstances under which people have operated. You know, we've had some proctored exams here at ULaw, others, you know, where people are, are doing the exams, but they're not being, they're not on a webcam the whole time. Um, and allowances are having to be made. And, you know, this whole COVID generation, and I don't like to use that term it, because it will even itself out but people will look and think you were you were part of this very difficult time in education but I think you just must say to yourself I've got to overcome the exam the exam is necessary but your working life is not an exam the work your working life is how you operate as a human being and if you can get through the exams you'll never look back i mean you will keep the notes because i've only just recently got rid of my notes from decades ago but it, this is a, a necessary professional training to go through in order to be a practitioner. And what I hope, you know, that you law will be doing is sending people out like they sent me out years ago who are able to go and practice. So the academic and the vocational training is a bit part of the much bigger picture. And it's all of the other things that we hope and feel that we are providing for you that will help to set you apart and make you more resilient in that workspace. That's great. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Caroline. Um, unfortunately, as I said, that um, Katie couldn't get back on, on the line. I think she, she will be available um, in the expo, expo booth after this. But she did want, she did put something in the chat uh, with regard to social mobility. She said that inclusion is the biggest issue in her view, either internal or external pressure to assimilate. And a um, study conducted by uh, Sherbin and Rashid shows that people who feel pressured to assimilate are 42% more likely to leave their job in the first 12 months. Um, so thanks for that, uh, Katie. If you want to speak to Katie and find out uh, more about the I Belong um, Club, please, um, after this session, um, join her if you click on the Expo uh, booth. That brings um, this evening um, to a close in, in terms of the um, speakers and also um, the Q&A session. I really want to um, thank Caroline, Musa, Sam, and uh, Leah for um, giving up their time so kindly and, and giving us your sort of, I, I suppose, um, lived experience and um, giving us lots of helpful hints and tips and lots to um, think about that I hope will, and I know will inspire those um, who have been listening. So um, thank you so much. And um, thanks to everyone uh, for joining us um, this evening and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.